In this review, I'm going to look at the Mare Optic Görlitz Orastor 100mm f2.8, a lens made in the German Democratic Republic in the 1960s and 70s. The Orastor was first introduced in 1966 and it came in different versions, M42 or exact amounts, initially with 14 or 15 blades, accounts differ, and then 6 blades, and the lens was sold under the Pentagon brand name after they acquired Mare. My copy is an M42 mount zebra style lens with 14 blades and this is one I'll be reviewing. I've also had the opportunity to briefly use a non-zebra 6 blade version and I'll talk a little about that one too. These lenses are interesting because they're quite an attractive focal length for portraits and they're not overly expensive for the performance they deliver. Plus of course this lens comes from the same company that made another 100mm f2.8 lens, the much sought after soap bubble bouquet monster, the Trio Plan. The first thing you'll notice about the Zebra version is how very cute it is, size-wise. It's really quite small for a telephoto lens. It's no surprise to find it's also known as the thin one versus the larger six-bladed version. I realise this isn't a totally relevant comparison, but here's the Orister up against the Helios 85mm. This says as much about the Orister's diminutive size as it does about the Helios's bulk. And here it is compared to a Pentagon 135mm lens. The lens itself weighs 260 grams. It's of a size and weight that can easily fit into your coat pocket, ready for a composition that suits the focal length on full frame, or a longer telephoto view on crop. The lens has five elements in four groups, so it's not a triplet like the Trio Plan, and it has an aperture dial at the front that is not clickless, but it has very little resistance as it moves through the stops. It feels well made, the focus throw is nicely damped, but the minimum focusing distance at 1.1 meters is not that good. I wish the lens could focus a little closer without extension tubes and so on. However, it still has a reasonably attractive depth of field for wide open shots. I use the lens on both crop and full frame sensors with an M42 adapter, and the photos in the video are from a mix of these cameras. So let's begin with the lens's wide open performance. When I tested the lens for sharpness wide open, I found it's nice and sharp at the center. Away from the centre, wide open, the rendering is softer, but this can work to give the centre more pop, so it's not all bad news. At f2.8, it's not the fastest lens, but the wide open bouquet is rather lovely, beautiful and smooth where there are no strong highlights or contrasts. The into and out of focus transitions are excellent, not surprising given its speed and that reasonably long MFD, because you can't get too close to see a very narrow sliver of depth of field. Where there are strong out-of-focus highlights, the bouquet balls are not huge, but they're distinctive, sometimes with a hint of soap bubble rendering, in terms of lines around the shapes. It's nothing like as prominent as the soap bubbles produced by the Trio Plan 100 f2.8. The Orister certainly isn't a substitute for that lens, which may or may not be a good thing according to your taste. The Orister's attractive bouquet is often helped by the colours the lens renders. The colours can be very bold and strong. In fact, I'd actually describe the colours as punchy. Here's a wall of colourful images from the lens straight out of camera. Where the colours complement the blur, the images can be very beautiful. However, where the colours don't complement the composition, they can swamp the bouquet and give it too punchy a look. The colours are not particularly warm. I spend quite a lot of time adjusting the colour saturation from this lens, something I find I have to do with some other old Mare Optic Gerlitz lenses as well, but with this lens I'm sometimes dialing back on the colours rather than trying to boost them. At this juncture I should add that for the short time I tried the six-bladed version of the lens, I didn't notice a big difference in rendering or sharpness or colours wide open. So if you're mostly interested in wide open shots, it may not make a big difference if you buy the cheaper six bladed copy, but you should double check this from other photos posted online. Stop down on the other hand, the extra blades do make a difference. Here's how those 14 blades impact out of focus highlights at each stop, and here you can see the advantage of having 14 blades. The effect of stopping down a few stops is pretty small on those attractive round out of focus highlights. This is a good thing, because it means you can stop down a little to sharpen up the image without losing those round highlights. Not that the lens needs sharpening up a lot at the centre wide open. Sharpness stopped down to f8 is very good. The soft corners and edges have gone. 
and for more telephoto type shots of people or for landscape and infinity shots, the lens performs well. It's fair to say the rendering and colour contrasts are not as good as modern digital lenses, but it's one of those lenses that has a distinctive vintage look and colour tone to landscape scenes, and it definitely has lots of character. I'd like to show you this stitch for a number of reasons. Firstly, it shows you how erratic my digital camera's auto exposure and auto white balance can be using an old lens. There's quite a variety of results here, taken at the same time in the same light. Secondly, if we zoom into the image, you can see how good the details are from the lens. Where there are out-of-focus areas in stop-down scenes, the strong colour contrasts again can produce rather busy blur, as you can see in transitions from wide open to stop-down. The lens handles bright light well and doesn't suffer from excessive light leaks or flares in most situations, so the contrasts remain good. It does flare, of course, but not extravagantly. There are some chromatic aberrations and colour fringing, but not significant enough to be a big problem. And now onto portraits where the Orister shines. It has good subject isolation and 3D pop wider open, and the cool colours give images a distinctive look, something different and perhaps more artistic and appealing than, say, a high-definition iPhone image. It's hard to make generalisations about the best focal length for portraits, and I'm not going to try, except to say that 100mm is an attractive length, most noticeably for head and shoulders portraits. Even when you step back, you get quite an intimate shot. You may need to play around with the colours and skin tones, but the raw material is certainly there for good results. If you want to see how others have used the Orister for portraits, then there are some good examples online. It's fun walking around with the lens on full frame and crop sensors. It gives you a long reach, without being too intrusive or obvious to others. It really doesn't look like you're using a telephoto lens on your camera. I particularly like to use the lens when I'm going to locations or events where there are a lot of interesting people and crowds and other subjects to photograph. It's perfect for that type of photography. So that's my review of the lens and its optical performance. I'm fond of the lens. It's sharp with punchy colours and I especially enjoy its small pocketable size. But I'll admit I don't use the lens a great deal. Maybe not as much as I should do. 100mm can be a bit of an in-between focal length, being both too long and too short. For example, it can be too long for an all-purpose walk-around lens. If we return to the stitch of images I showed you earlier, these shots were taken on a full-frame camera, and I think they show why I personally don't use the lens as my only walk-around lens on trips. 100mm is not wide enough to capture a lot of many scenes, and it's even less useful on a crop sensor. I tend to prefer a wider angle, and even for family snaps, something in the 50 to 60mm region is probably better. For telephoto shots, I find 135mm opens up more opportunities, but those lenses also tend to be larger and heavier. As an in-between kind of focal length for my kind of shots, one important thing I've learned from preparing this review is that the Orestra is a lens that will encourage you to be more creative with your compositions before and after you've taken the photo. It's one of those lenses that you may not always immediately warm to images when you see them on your computer screen back home. But when you look at the images later, sometimes months or even years later, you'll think, well, they're rather good. I think I can do something rather interesting with this one. Your comments will be most welcome. I know there are some cracking alternative portrait lenses out there and some great macros around this focal length. Please subscribe if you haven't already done so. And until the next time, all the best.